When you think of some of the great societies that obtained mastery of chemistry to better their lives, you probably think of ancient Greece, where the concept of the fundamental particles of matter was first discussed. Maybe images of Chinese and Indian thinkers developing the world's first dyes and explosives and alchemical labs cross your thoughts. And of course, the European Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution can't be left out of the discussion either. But in truth, nearly every society in recorded history made its contributions to mankind's understanding of chemistry. Sometimes discoveries were made and lost by one, only to be discovered again, centuries, or even millennia later, by another. Thankfully, the information age has cured us of this odd artifact of cultural isolation. The past few hundred years have heralded an age in which understanding is perpetually advanced, rather than perpetually lost and reacquired. But history has left us with many intriguing and inspiring stories of these kinds of lost discoveries. And one of these is a chemical process discovered and used by a group of people not usually associated with great chemical achievements. I'm referring to the Mesoamerican societies from about 3,000 years ago. The Mayan, Aztec, and Olmec societies of Mesoamerica are well known for their love of sport. One particular sport that they seem to enjoy involved the use of a ball. No surprise there. But what's interesting about these balls that they use is that they weren't like the ones we see in modern sports arenas. They were made from this material, natural rubber, a substance consisting of almost unimaginably long hydrocarbon molecules, creating a thick, sticky material that becomes somewhat brittle as it slowly hardens over time. Now you probably had the same thought that I just did. How is a thick, sticky ball that becomes brittle with age any use in a sporting game? Well, the answer is, it's not. Which leads to a more interesting question. Why and how did the Mayans make this material useful for that application? That question plagued two researchers at MIT in 1996. A student by the name of Michael J. Tarkanian posed a question to his professor, Dorothy Hostler, in an archaeology class at MIT that year. So intrigued was Hostler that she and Tarkanian embarked on a collaboration to find the answer. During their research, they learned that Spanish conquistadors had written of locals mixing the sap-like substance from trees with the juice of morning glory flowers. And they learned that in differing proportions, these ingredients could be combined to alter the properties of rubber from sticky or brittle to instead make it dry, bouncy, and durable, the perfect characteristics of a ball suitable for athletic play. In this lecture, we're going to discover the key to understanding how these two unlikely ingredients, tree sap and morning glory juice, led to a new and useful material employed by the Maya, Olmec, and Aztec cultures 3,000 years ago, and also, it turns out, by you today. So our current lecture is all about polymers. Polymers are a class of compounds that we're all somewhat familiar with. The tires on your car, the bulletproof vests protecting soldiers and police, the ropes supporting mountain climbers, and the packaging that protects our food and water from spoilage are all very often made from polymers. But what are polymers? Well, polymers are, simply put, a molecular version of one of these, a chain. Just as chains consist of long series of simple links attached to one another, polymers are long series of molecules attached to one another by molecular bonds. We call each link in a polymer a monomer. Now, for example, the natural rubber that we were talking about just earlier would be built from a subunit or a monomer that looks like this. This molecule is called isoprene. It's rather small, isn't it? But notice that there is a pi bond here. Now, those are somewhat weak compared to sigma bonds. So what if I could find a way to take this isoprene molecule and attach it to a second one, creating a sigma bond connection? That would be energetically favorable, wouldn't it? Now, connecting these two monomers creates what's called a dimer. And I could also, say, bring in a third. Right? Now that I have three subunits connected, I have what's known as a trimer. If I continue connecting more and more subunits, eventually I create a very long chain, which we would call a polymer. Now, keeping in mind that these chains can easily reach thousands of linked monomers or more, we can quickly run out of patience for coming up with naming systems for this, right? So we collectively call shorter chains of a dozen or so oligomers, and any really long chain like the one that we just saw, a polymer. 
Now let's give the Mayans a short break and move on to another question. What gives trees and lumber their remarkable rigidity to allow them to grow hundreds of feet high in some cases, yet just the right amount of flexibility to weather the most severe of storms? It's a very good question to ask, since wood has been and continues to be a building material of choice all over the world for just those reasons. Live trees, timber, and lumber alike all share these properties of strength and flexibility. But how do trees accomplish this? How do they manage to construct themselves to heights of hundreds of feet, tough enough to resist all but the sturdiest of human-made tools, and yet pliable enough to give and flex under the force of hurricanes? This question interested some of the greatest thinkers of the 1800s, beginning with a French chemist by the name of Anselm Payen. Payen may be one of the earliest agricultural chemists, though he's seldom acknowledged as such. I say that because he's credited with discovering the chemical compound that gives trees and other plants the remarkable properties that I just described. Payen isolated a compound that he named cellulose, the cell portion because it is the principal component of plant cell walls, and the eulose suffix because it was known to have an empirical formula similar to that of common sugars, whose names bear the same ending. Now, it would take almost 100 years and a ferocious debate for scientists to realize what cellulose really is and how it achieves its incredibly useful properties. For many decades, establishment scientists worked with cellulose, natural rubber, and many other tough, useful materials, assuming that they were simply aggregates of small molecules like glucose, clinging to one another through exceptionally potent intermolecular forces. Then, in 1920, a young upstart chemist by the name of Hermann Staudinger dared to publish a paper offering a new theory. Staudinger hypothesized that compounds like rubber and cellulose were not aggregates of small molecules, but instead monstrously long molecules linked throughout by covalent chemical bonds. Staudinger's new hypothesis was brilliant. It was game-changing. It was thought-provoking. And it was summarily dismissed by the likes of Emil Fischer, one of the greatest minds in carbohydrate chemistry of his day. Young Staudinger was in for a fight, but he didn't back down. Staudinger vehemently defended his theory against Fischer, a highly regarded chemist 30 years his senior. And to call his decision to stand his ground against Fischer bold would probably be an understatement. But Staudinger knew he had a good idea. It took time to prove, but in 1930, the relatively new technique of X-ray crystallography finally proved him right. Cellulose was not a disjointed, disordered aggregate of glucose molecules. Far from it. Cellulose is, in fact, a polymer comprised of long chains of sugar monomers. These long chains are held together by powerful covalent networks that extend for thousands of sugars along any given chain. Now, weave those chains together into a sort of molecular rope held by a massive network of hydrogen bonds made possible by the OH bonds in the sugar monomers. Oh, right. Now you have the molecular makings of a material of remarkable toughness and pliability. So, confirmation of the structure of cellulose shattered the paradigm that only small molecules existed in our world, and that Staudinger's macromolecules were in fact real. This changed our thinking about materials and their properties and forced scientists to take a whole new look at some ancient materials that we thought we previously understood. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we've already seen how Staudinger's theory explains the properties of some compounds. Take the example of rubber, polyisoprene, resistant to water because it's a hydrocarbon, but amazingly thick and viscous compared to other hydrocarbons. This can all be explained by enormously long hydrocarbon chains composed of polyisoprene sliding along one another, clinging tenuously to one another through van der Waals forces, but bonded within chains by massive networks of covalent bonds hundreds, thousands, or even millions of monomers long. How about cellulose? Can the epiphany of macromolecules explain its properties? Absolutely. Imagine glucose units linked together in chains of thousands. Not only are these individual chains held together by networks of thousands of strong covalent bonds, but multiple chains can interact through hydrogen bonds. The covalent networks give it amazing tensile and compressional strength, 
but the hydrogen bond networks give it just the right shear strength, able to bend but not break, as a tree in a hurricane wind or a piece of lumber in a settling house would experience. So, we've seen how polymers like natural rubber and cellulose have been a part of human civilization for just about as long as human civilization has existed itself. But it is human nature to be dissatisfied with what nature offers us. As a species, we have always been curious and hungry to create better materials for our own use. For evidence of this, we need to look no further than our opening story on the Mayan culture. Hostler and Tarkanian discovered that the secret ingredient in the special Mayan sports equipment was the juice from morning glories. Somehow, adding this juice to natural rubber made it more resilient and less sticky. So, what was going on there? Well, it turns out that, like so many chemists after them, the Mayans were just improving on what nature had already accomplished. Morning glory juice contains a fair amount of sulfur. And sulfur likes to react with the carbon-carbon pi bonds in polyisoprene to form what we commonly call disulfide bridges. This reaction replaces the weaker carbon-carbon pi bonds with new sigma bonds between the carbon atoms and the newly introduced sulfur, of course. These bridges lock each individual polyisoprene unit into place within the polymer, creating a compound that snaps back to its original form after being deformed. Sounds like a recipe for something bouncy, doesn't it? After all, what is bouncing if not deforming temporarily before recovering original shape? It's a remarkable combination, isn't it? One that almost certainly discovered by accident at some point and used to the advantage of Mayan athletes across the empire in 1000 BC. But their discovery was lost to the ages, relegated to a few obscure pages in the journal of a Spanish conquistador, awaiting discovery at MIT just a few years ago. In the meantime, who knows how many times this invention was rediscovered in various cultures and lost again, until eventually, in 1834, a failed hardware merchant from Pennsylvania had the good fortune to lose his temper. The merchant's name was Charles Goodyear, and he had tried to redeem himself from a streak of previous business failures by creating a new material that would change the world, and he had his eye on rubber. Goodyear theorized, quite incorrectly, that natural rubber's tendency to be sticky and deform was caused by residual water coming from its natural plant source. So he tried to improve upon its characteristics with one drying agent after another, with marginal results at best. Then there came a breaking point for Goodyear, when he was mocked in a Massachusetts general store for his latest effort to use sulfur to dry his rubber. As the story goes, a furious Goodyear shook his fist, losing a small amount of the rubber-sulfur mixture he had come to display. By his luck, it was winter, and his mixture landed on a roaring pot-bellied wood stove. Not one to be wasteful, he said about recovering his sample. But when he examined his recovered sample, he noted that something had changed. His sample was now tough, dry, and held its shape. Goodyear had created vulcanized rubber, the same material first concocted by the Mayans 3,000 years earlier. All he had been missing was the heat of the Central American summer sun, which was conveniently emulated by the pot-bellied stove. So on a cold day in a Massachusetts winter, a failed hardware salesman reinvented the same material used by the Mayan civilization millennia ago. His invention, now known as vulcanized rubber, is a rubber so bouncy, durable, and tough that it's the basis still for materials that we rely on in ways that we sometimes take for granted. Shoe soles, water hoses, and of course modern tires all make use of this inimitable material. So, from the Mayan and Aztec empires all the way up to Goodyear and beyond, humanity has benefited from the modification of rubber, the granddaddy of all polymers. Cultures, both ancient and recent, have ultimately come up with the same way to combine the reagents available at the time to create new products with amazing new properties. But the task of the chemist is not just to improve upon nature, but to find ways to take what nature has taught us about the potential of molecules and make them better from the ground up. To that end, we have created polymers all our own, man-made, from scratch. There are several ways to classify these synthetic polymers. 
Sometimes we group them based on the chemistry used to create them, and other times by the type and arrangement of monomers that make them up. Um, to fully understand polymer chemistry, we have to consider both of these techniques. So let's start with the first. The first method of classifying polymers is based upon the chemistry that creates them. And the simplest chemistry one can use simply clicks monomers together without any byproducts forming. We call this kind of polymer an addition polymer. And the best example of an addition polymer is this, polyethylene. As the name implies, the material making up this water bottle, for example, was constructed actually from ethylene gas. Addition polymers are generally created from monomers, of course. I'm going to show those just as uh, generic red squares here, or red rectangles, which come together in a process called chain growth. Now, the individual monomers themselves aren't particularly reactive, but in the presence of a special chemical initiator, each time a new monomer connects, it itself becomes reactive, thereby causing the chain itself to extend. So a chain growth process using these generic markers would look something like this, in which each monomer connects to the end of a growing chain and therefore becomes activated itself. An example of this is polyethylene that we were just discussing, in which we use an organic radical as an initiator, and we use that to kick off the reaction between and among various numbers of ethylene molecules. And as the reaction takes place, notice it's growing from one end of the chain to the other. And in doing so, we can create long hydrocarbon chains of hundreds and even thousands upon thousands of these individual monomer units before this activated radical here is finally quenched in a reaction with another radical somewhere in the mixture. Using this process, we can create hydrocarbon molecules of tremendous size and complexity. For example, we can create long chains of hydrocarbons that are called high-density polyethylene that are used in, for example, the manufacture of toys. Or we can use a few tricks to introduce more branching into the molecule, creating low-density polyethylene, which is used in, for example, the plastic bags that you find in your local grocery store. All of these materials, though, interestingly enough, are made from one very, very simple starting material, ethylene gas. Just a little bit of careful consideration in how we put together the polymer can create a drastically different and useful uh, material. Because this reaction takes place with no byproducts generated at all, its product is classified as an addition polymer. Polyethylene is a remarkable product, considering how simple its structure really is. Since its discovery in 1933, scientists have developed ways to control the size and even the branching of this structure to create a variety of polyethylene materials. But ethylene isn't the only monomer that works in this strategy. Those four hydrogen atoms are just placeholders. Replacing them with different atoms or groups of atoms creates even more useful materials, like polyvinyl chloride, commonly known as PVC, or this one, polystyrene, which is constructed from styrene monomers and used in everything from seat cushions to CD jewel cases. Now, the second class of polymers I want to discuss today is condensation polymers. Condensation polymers differ from addition polymers because they produce a byproduct when monomers come together to form them. These byproducts are usually very small and often include water, from which the process gets its name, even though production of water is not a requirement for a polymer to fit into this class. Condensation polymers differ from addition polymers in the sense that they rarely need an activator to, in to initiate the polymerization reaction. This makes them fairly easy to create in some instances, but it makes them harder to control because if we have a collection of monomers, all of which can react with one another, we go through a process known as step growth instead of chain growth. And as you can see here, it's not as controlled of a process. The resulting molecules are of drastically different sizes often. So although they're more difficult to control, they're very often used because they can produce some remarkably useful and versatile materials themselves. And not the least of these is nylon 6-6, in which we take two different types of monomers, in this case a molecule known as adipic acid, and one called hexylmethylene diamine, that's shown up here with the nitrogens. And they react with one another in a step growth process that produces water as a byproduct. So as these molecules come together, they form water, which energetically drives the reaction forward, leading to relatively large molecules joined by these special bonds here called amide bonds. 
So nylon 6.6 6 is a polymer of relatively large monomers. And you can imagine one of these having thousands upon thousands of these. And if you look carefully, as this molecule passes by, you'll see those distinct sets of monomers within the polymer itself. This is nylon 6.6. 6. Condensation polymers include not only nylon, but other familiar polymers as well, such as the polyester material Dacron, the Kevlar in bulletproof vests, and the polycarbonate material in Lexan, used to make bulletproof glass. Now, a second method of characterizing polymers is based not upon the type of bond that holds them together, but rather on how many different monomers are used and how they're arranged. Recall that polyethylene consists of only ethylene monomers strung together in a long chain. That is to say, just one kind of monomer making up the entirety of the polymer. But take our second example, nylon 6.6. 6. This polymer was made by condensing two different monomers together in the chain. When we have two or more monomers included in the same macromolecule, we call the resulting polymer a copolymer. Copolymers are amazing because they open up a whole new dimension in polymer design. It's no longer just about how long or branched a polymer chain is, but how the multiple monomers within it are arranged. Regardless of how they're synthesized, we can classify polymers also based upon how they're put together at the monomer level. Now, for example, let's take a look at a molecule that has two different types of monomers. If we put these monomers together in an alternating pattern, we get what you would call an alternating copolymer. And we've already seen an example of an alternating copolymer, that of nylon 6.6, 6, in which we had two different monomers, but they were specifically chosen so that they could only react with monomers of the other variety. And this leads to an alternating copolymer. Another type of copolymer are random copolymers, in which we still have two distinct monomers, but those two distinct monomers can react with not only monomers of a different type, but also monomers of the same type. And when this happens, we get a random orientation of them within that polymer. And this is a classic example of how we can create things like heat-sensitive or heat-resistant shrink wraps, for example, that you would use on your food. There's also something known as a block copolymer. In a block copolymer, what we have is a situation where we have large stretches of one monomer followed by, again, large stretches of the other monomer within the same large macromolecule. Block copolymers are a great strategy for creating things like industrial strength adhesives and also some very specialized rubbers that you often find in modern tire formulations. So let's review what we discussed today. We started in an unlikely place, ancient Mesoamerica. There we saw how the Aztec, Olmec, and Mayan cultures might have been the very first polymer chemists in human history, mixing natural rubber with morning glory juices to produce a crude form of vulcanized rubber. This product was then lost to the ages for nearly 3,000 years before Charles Goodyear's serendipitous accident in Woburn, Massachusetts reintroduced it to the world. Then we got down to business, defining polymers as long chains of monomer reagents joined by chemical bonds to one another. We met Herman Staudinger, whose battle to convince the scientific establishment of the existence of macromolecules ultimately led to a Nobel Prize for him. We discussed semi-synthetic polymers, like Goodyear's vulcanized rubber, and how chemically modifying natural polymers can drastically change their properties. Then, we concluded our discussion with wholly synthetic polymers. We saw how these remarkable materials can be produced by addition reactions or condensation reactions. And finally, we considered what happens when we open our minds to the possibility that multiple types of monomers can be incorporated into the same synthetic polymer. It's impressive what chemists can accomplish with synthetic polymers. But don't get a big head about it. Because next time, we're going to see how nature uses polymers with complexity and functionality that put polymer chemists to shame. So we spent some time during this lecture thinking about polymers, how they're put together, the different types of syntheses that can be used to make them, and how their monomers can be related in space to create new materials with new properties. So let's turn that on its head with a challenge problem 
and start from a polymer structure and back calculate how it can be put together. Specifically, let's start with a very common polymer, polystyrene. Now, polystyrene is an addition homopolymer, meaning that it's synthesized with no byproduct formation and it has only one type of monomer that's used to create it. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the structure of polystyrene and see if we can back calculate what its monomer must be. Now this is a uh, what we would call a van der Waals or a space filling representation and the polymer would of course continue along this axis for many hundreds or even thousands and thousands of units. But its structure looks a little bit more like this in ball and stick, still a bit hard to see, so I've drawn it out in a different type of representation here where we can see the long chain of carbon-carbon bonds that hold the polymer together and these rings here which are drawn to correspond to these rather large rings here of six carbon atoms that we would call a phenyl group. So our task is to take the structure of polystyrene and determine from which monomers could it be made. So in order to do that I'm going to make a duplicate of my structure and then I'm going to ask myself how could I make that from monomers in a reaction in which I have only one type of monomer and a reaction in which I have no byproduct formation? Well, clearly what we're going to have to do here is consider how to break this chain in such a way that we make pi bonds because addition polymers tend to form from monomers that have reactive pi bonds that help to build up the chain. So, in order to calculate or determine what my monomers will be, all I need to do is look along the chain here and ask myself if I break this carbon-carbon bond, for example, and then the next equivalent, and then the next equivalent, using those electrons to make pi bonds on the adjacent carbons, right, that would be this one here, this one here, and this one here. Let's see what happens. So let's break those bonds and create the new pi bonds. Ah, we've created monomers, haven't we? And we've done so in a way that corresponds with an addition polymer formation. Right? That's because, in this case, there can't be any byproducts, which means there can't be any products going in in the reverse process. So this structure here, which corresponds to a molecule called styrene, looks just like this. And knowing that polystyrene is an addition homopolymer has allowed me to determine exactly which monomer I could use to make it based upon the fact that this pi bond right here is able to go through that regular addition process in chain growth which creates molecules like this one. So our monomer for polystyrene is of course the styrene molecule and this is its structure.